Welcome to Make and Decorate, a podcast for makers who love to sew, quilt, knit, and decorate. Welcome to the Make and Decorate with Stephanie podcast. This is episode 102 and I am Stephanie. I hope you are all well and making all the creative things. The topic of today's episode is AI, artificial intelligence in our maker world. I have researched and tested two GAIs, which are generative artificial intelligence programs available at the moment for free until they switch over to a monthly subscription rate in the future. I think this is a very hot topic right now, and I keep hearing about it. So I decided to check it out myself and report back to you on my findings. Let's start with some chit chat. We here in the Midwest and South Heartland of the U.S. are fully in tornado season, Last Friday, there were severe storms around my house with very high winds. And just to the west of us in Iowa, there were some devastating tornadoes. And to the south, there were even more destructive tornadoes taking out entire towns. Uh, And if you have been affected by these horrific storms, I do send my heartfelt thoughts and prayers to all of you. It's just, I just can't even fathom what it is like to be in the middle of this raging, turbulent tornado that um, has like almost 200 mile an hour winds. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it comes with the changing of the seasons and. And like I said, this is tornado season. We don't get very many touchdown tornadoes where I am at. There are some areas just to the south of me. And it is just strange because I think um, the the size of the tornadoes and the path that they take, um, you could be literally like um, 50 yards to either side and not get touched and then 50 yards you know to the left or right of you it's total destruction it's it's very bizarre and you know just crazy how that works so I hope everyone is okay there are some sunny days ahead into the weekend which will be very nice for Easter so it'll be very nice to have a break in the turbulent weather and have a bit of sunshine and nicer Um, spring temperatures. My sister in Iowa and her family are driving into town for the weekend and the kids love to go to Brookfield Zoo. I live within a few miles from that zoo so I always seem to get wrangled into going with a gaggle of small kiddos and my sister is sneaky that way. She invites me to relieve her of full kid duty, divide and conquer. And I guess I don't blame her um, because right now she's got a three-year-old, a six-year-old, a nine-year-old, and a new 14-year-old teenager. Well, she's not new, but I mean, she's newer to her teen years. And she's, uh, yeah, she's kind of getting into that too cool for us, too cool for school phase. And uh, I can guarantee you, I will be so exhausted after a few hours of wrangling small kiddos. <laughs> Two of them are boys and the three-year-old is a boy that is a little daredevil and always on the move. Uh, so that will be interesting for sewing and quilting. I have been on a productive roll with the king size iris chain quilt piecing. I am so happy I've made a lot of progress. And one of the things that has made the piecing of this quilt much better is a new rolling cart that I got from Amazon. The link will be in the show notes. Up until last week, I had been using an old wood TV tray to hold 
a wool pressing mat and my mini iron to press all the little pieces after chain piecing. Uh, and then pressing when you put the chain piecing again with the four and a half inch blocks. It was okay, but was wobbly. And the wobble finally resulted in a collapse of the tray table. It just fell. And uh, when I lifted it up, I, I saw that the bottom bar had totally broken off of it. And uh, so, yeah, that was it for that tray table. Uh, the I put it in my husband's office and let him decide if he wants to fix it or not. But that tray table is at least 12 to 15 years old. And uh, it's really done its job. And I could have bought brought another one of our newer tray tables up to my studio, but um, what I really wanted was something mobile that could roll under my cutting table when not in use, and also to have a top where I could put my pressing mat and mining iron onto. And um, so I was on the search for that. It was a bit time consuming, but it paid off. So in order for it to roll under my cutting table, it needed to be 30 and three quarters inches tall or less. And many roller carts are 31 inches tall, up to 33 inches tall. Uh, a lot of them have those little side handles, and that makes the height um, go up there about three inches. And uh I was tempted to cave in and get the taller one because it was a nice design and it had pretty colors like teal and blush, uh, but I did end up shaking it off and kept to my task at hand. Uh, I found what I hoped to be the perfect solution, a three-tier rolling cart with a removable wood top and three basket tiers on casters. And the two front casters have locks, but the color choices were limited. So that's why I kind of sort of hemmed and hawed for a bit uh, until I finally just went for it, knowing that, okay, if it doesn't work, I'll just send it back, right? Uh, so although I don't like doing that, it's just too much work, right? <laughs> uh, and so I went with the, there is a soft white cream color. And it has a medium dark brown wood top. The main thing I was concerned about with this roller cart was the small size. And it's definitely smaller than like a standard rolling cart size as far as the width and the depth. Uh, so I, I just went with it. I ordered it because the height was great. It was 30.3 inches tall. And uh, when I got the cart, uh, the color, that, that cream color is very pretty. So I was really happy with that. And the, um, the cart only took me about 20 minutes total to assemble it. It was very easy. And the tool provided that tightens the screws worked really well. Um, it was a very solid feeling cart when I had it all put together. The casters are great and are very smooth moving. And uh, then when I saw the size of this cart 3D, um, I was concerned because it looked really small. <laughs> and But I decided to give it a try because it moved around so well and it rolled under the cutting table. So I thought, you know what, let me give it a try and see if it'll work for me or if it'll be too small. And the uh, pressing mat that I had been using on the tray table was definitely too big for this little roller cart. Uh, I think it was like 17 inches wide and um, I needed like an 11 by 14 mat size. Uh, and I, I ordered, I ended up ordering a 14 inch square wool press mat. And this was not the like high end nice one that I have at my main ironing station. It wasn't, an, it was inexpensive and it came with like a silicone iron mat and, uh, a purple thing tool. 
uh, which was um, nice little extras, but I really wanted the wool mat first and foremost. Uh, but it was really quite the deal. And the quality of mat was, as I expected, not excellent, but not terrible for what I needed it for. And it fits uh, really well across the width of the roller cart perfectly, the 14 inches wide, but the, you know, then it's 14 inches uh, depth wise. So that leaves it a couple of inches too big on the cart, but it doesn't hang over floppy like the other press mat did it because there's not that much of an overhang. So it really works. It, it works as well as it can. And uh, I, I could cut it to size. I know I could probably try to do that, but I don't want to because cutting it would disrupt the whatever they have holding it together, adhesive or whatever, uh, the, the felting. And I just don't want it to fall apart. So I'm leaving it as the 14 by 14 and it works fine. It works so much better uh, than the other press mat that's way, way too big. Uh, and then my mini steam fast iron fell and a foot broke off and it really made that very unsafe. I, I tried using it for an afternoon and uh, the one foot just makes it wobble and twist and it could fall on my hand at any moment. So that was uh, uh, not fun. And I, uh, I got a new same type uh, and brand and style of iron, uh, the Mini Steam Fast. It's a really good iron. I've had my um, existing one since probably around 2015. I remember that I got it. I ordered it from Craftsy when, uh, before it was Blueprint. And um, it's the best Mini Steam iron out there, in my opinion. I also do have a Mini Oliso iron. I use it downstairs when I sew downstairs and keep it with my travel bag, sewing bag. Uh, it is also a good iron, but it's not great because I feel that it has an awkward grip. And um, because when you hold it and pick it up, it's only a sort of like a narrow indention of a I mean, if you could say it's a handle, it really isn't. Um, and so that's awkward. And then it also gets very hot. So the part that you grip, if the iron is on the highest heat setting, which you want it to be when you're working with cotton and linen, it heats up the handle. So then I have to turn the heat down a lot uh, in order to handle that uh, Oliso mini iron. Um, otherwise, everything else about it is great. You know, it's the shape of it and has a nice sharp point. Uh, the steam works really well. Uh, so I'll, you know, definitely continue to use it. Um, but I uh, decided just to get, replace my mini steam fast with another mini steam fast. It's a fraction of the price of the Oliso and it works probably better. It doesn't have the, you know, square inches that the Oliso has. It's a little bit smaller, but it is perfect for sitting next to your sewing machine so that you can just press your quilt seams um, while you're uh, piecing them. So this rolling cart is dedicated to this quilt projects. I place all of the completed partial blocks into the two lower baskets, along with the four and a half inch square ruler. And it's so organized and I feel so much better continuing on with this project. It's one of those things where you say, why didn't I get this sooner? The tray table that I had was stationary and I had to be lifted every time I needed to start and stop the project or take a break because I kind of like closed myself in <laughs> with that tray table to the left of me. And uh, 
Uh, so I would have to move it to move from my sewing machine out to get out. Uh, and this roller cart changes all of that. It moves so smoothly. I can just push it, you know, several inches away so that I can get in and out so easily. And it rolls under the, the cutting table so easily, stashes, stashes there, you know, um, out of sight when it's not in use. And it is amazing. So I will put the link in the show notes in case you need this in your sewing life as well. Knitting. I'm still on a break with knitting, but I can't resist making a few of the Arne and Carlos knitted Easter eggs. These are really small projects, tiny projects. It only takes me a couple of evenings to complete one. And I just finished um, a really cute pink and white cherry blossom design egg. Uh, and I am knitting on these four inch long double pointed needles, which this was my first project on those um, four inch DPNs. They were a birthday gift to me last week from my husband. I totally forgot that I put them on my Amazon list sometime last year. And they work really nicely on the egg project. Only the part where it gets to the widest point of the egg is where uh, I tend to think I need another inch of <laughs> length on these needles. But otherwise, it's so great for these tiny projects. And especially when you get down to like the three stitches on each needle, uh, it, it's not um, that awkward when you have the longer ones. But I would probably say the six inch double pointed needles would probably be best. Uh, and I think I only have the eight inch ones. Uh, so I'll have to check on that, but I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then the next egg I'm going to make is the duck egg design. And since Easter is just like around the corner here, I probably, that's probably all I will be able to make this year, but I'll be happy with just those couple of eggs that when I look at them, they make me happy, right? Uh, it's springtime and I just, I just love seeing all of the spring uh, flowers and accessories uh, projects out there. And my daffodils are in full bloom. They're so pretty. Bright yellow daffodils. I love that. My tulips are, are growing well too. They don't bloom for probably another few weeks. So um, yeah, we are, we're definitely into spring now. Um, the weather here has definitely changed and we're, we're climbing up into those um, 50, uh, almost 60 degree days. We're out of the 40s, thank goodness, knock on wood. <laughs> uh, so hopefully we'll be progressing temperature wise and maybe by the next episode we will have had uh, a few 60 degree days. I have not made a bag pattern in a very long time. And I recently saw that Sarah Lawson over at So Sweetness is releasing a new Minikins group of patterns. It's Minikins 4. So this is her fourth group of Minikin patterns where it is a group of 12 patterns. They're usually small bags, pouches, organizers, and storage patterns that are more on the quick side to make. I've seen her posting uh, reveals on her Instagram, So Sweetness, and she shows them four at a time on her YouTube channel, So Sweetness. I'll put links to those YouTube videos in the show notes. So not all 12 of the bag um, or patterns have been revealed yet, but uh, they have eight. From those eight, I love, love this Enigma pouch. It is a zippered pouch that opens flat. And the zipper is placed almost a little asymmetric and it, it goes across the side of the bag like a diagonal. It's a pretty brilliant construction. And when it opens flat, 
Um, it has deep sides and gussets and a middle zipper uh, pocket. It is a really good looking bag and can be used in so many, so many ways uh, for sewing, storage, threads. Um, you could put English paper piecing stuff in there. So I love that bag. It just looks really cool. And I love it when it's fully opened. That's part of it. What else? Oh, storage cubes. But she's got large storage cubes. This is so good. I have been wanting larger storage cubes. And so those are part of it. And another one is a zippered book cover with a handle. That is a great pattern that's very useful um, and a great gift to give people and kids and teachers, anyone who loves to read. And it is, um, I love that it's zippered. And uh, she says that it can, it's deep enough that it can hold uh, a Harry Potter book, which is um, a really thick book. There's a yoga bag with a zipper and extra space for a towel or change of clothes. It's a really nicely designed bag. Uh, there's a water bottle bag. That is really useful for summertime. So like when we take Cooper to the dog beach, I don't want to be encumbered with, of course, my purse or anything. So I usually put stuff in my uh, beach backpack. But then the backpack is on the back of me. <laughs> It's so hard to reach for things if we're, you know, in the middle of walking. And so this water bottle bag is, it's cute. It's so nice. It can hold any size water bottle. She had like a 40 ounce water bottle in there, but then she also showed it with a smaller size water bottle. It cinches closed around the bottle and, and there is a little zipper um, pocket in the front of it where you can put your cell phone or keys or whatever. It has a uh, nylon strapping with it and uh, adjustable hardware. So I'm sure you could wear it uh, crossbody or over your shoulder. And I think it is just a very clever little uh, carrying pouch for when you're on the go in the summertime. Uh, there's a couple of others she introduced. Oh, a sewing machine cover. And you could easily adjust the measurements to fit your sewing machine because it is basically just like a rectangle cover. It's not really shaped uh, for a specific machine. And there is a one piece pencil pouch with a zipper. So simple. And it looks really cute. And Sarah has these really pretty um, multicolor zippers in her shop now. There's like the rainbow kind. And it looks really good on uh, projects like that where the zipper is sort of like right there uh, visible. There is a small purse type bag. And it has a lot of pockets. There's two pockets inside. And then there's a magnetic pocket, exterior pocket on the front. And that also has a long strap for carrying it crossbody um, or could be adjusted to any length. So those are the patterns that have been revealed so far. This is a really good um, bundle of patterns. I think that the diverse type of patterns that are in it. Like it's not all um, the same type of, of bag. Like they're not all zipper pouches or um, crossbody bags. It's like a pencil pouch and a yoga mat carrying bag, a sewing machine cover. It's really very useful and functional items that are... Um, more or less quick and easy to make. And a lot of these would make really great gifts as well. I'm excited about this. There's four more patterns I think that Sarah will uh, reveal soon, probably within the week. And this Minikin 4 pattern group will be available to purchase on April 16th, which is just a week and a half away. I also noticed that Sarah is incorporating cork handles 
uh, cool hardware and zippers, as well as nylon strapping. Okay, I have to pause for a second. I kept saying nylon strapping throughout the episode, and it is actually nylon webbing. So just every time I say strapping, just know that it is nylon webbing. All right, before we get into the main topic, I'll just update you on what I've been watching. And one of the shows I talked about previously was Ted Lasso season three, which is in its final season. And for me, it kind of had like a, I don't know, not so great start, but it has been getting better. So they have really good, you know, as usual, comedic um, parts and characters so we're we're enjoying watching it, um, but I'm still I'm still kind of glad that it's the last season. Also, uh, Mandalorian, it's it's good. You know, my husband likes it better than I do, but uh, it's still it's still pretty good. The Baby Yoda, I, I, as I always say, is the one character I always look for in these episodes. And last weekend, we watched Wakanda Forever, and we haven't seen that yet. So uh, it's another Marvel movie based on a comic book. And <laughs> I sound like a broken record. Again, it's Marvel movies are not my favorite thing, but I have seen pretty much all of them because of my husband. Oh, the things we do for the people we love. But Wakanda Forever. It was really good. I was pleasantly surprised. And uh, the storyline was pretty gripping and the actors were great. Uh, the only thing that sort of got on my nerves <laughs> was how many times they said Wakanda forever. It's just like the Mandalorian. They say this is the way a million times. So after like the first 10 times I say it in an episode, I finally can't, I can't take it. And I'm just yelling back at the TV. Stop saying it. Yes, we know this is the way you're Mandalorians. We get it. <laughs> That's probably just me. But those are the two things that kind of uh, irritated me with those two shows. Anyway, I digress. So with my new PBS subscription, I did watch the entire season of Sanditon, season three, also the last season of this series, and also probably a good thing. It's more or less the same drama from the first couple of seasons. In fact, I think the first season was the best, and... But it's still a good show. It's still I'm still watching it with bated breath, and I love seeing the um, the ocean and the the scenery, the landscape, the costumes. Uh, and but it's just you know the main character starts to really get on my nerves because she has to you know, be this stubborn martyr person who is so selfless that she just just can never do anything for herself. And then it's like, poor her, you know? So I'm not going to give anything else away. It's just those were my immediate reactions and thoughts to um, this season and uh, really the show, except for the first season, was, she wasn't like that in the first season. But, you know, the second season and definitely the third season. Um, yeah, it, it went there. But anyway, it is still good. I still recommend it. It's only six episodes long. So that was Sanditon. There's another. Uh, this was not PBS. This was Hulu. It's an Irish show. Uh, called North Sea Connection. This is a crime series, six episodes, and it takes place around Galway, Ireland, in a fishing village community, a small community. And um, there is a family that 
inadvertently, I would say, uh, gets thrown into drug smuggling. (laughs) And uh, apparently uh, it's, well, in the show they say it's a common thing with uh, the fishing villages or uh, fishing ports. Uh, That's a way where they like to uh, transport drugs. And uh, chaos really ensues in this show. And uh, it's a brother sister involvement in this. And then there is then a Swedish character introduced who is looking into this case of drug smuggling. Uh, and um, uh, I think I'm just kind of like um, rambling too much with this. So, anyway, it's pretty good. I really enjoyed it until the last episode. And then it just ended in the middle of all these unanswered things. And hopefully a second season is coming. I looked it up and it does sound like uh, there will be a second season. There better be because I really did not like the last episode because it just felt like there needed to be one more episode. Um, because, I, you know, there's a such thing as a cliffhanger and then there's like a whole mountain <laughs> hanging in the balance. So that's what this was. But I liked it. It's it was it's a good show. A um, little dark. North Sea Connection is the name of that one. OK, so let's get into our main topic today, which is AI, artificial intelligence in our maker life. What is AI? Artificial intelligence is the simulation of human intelligent processes by machines, especially computer systems. The development of AI can be traced back to the mid-20th century. The term artificial intelligence was first coined in 1956 by computer scientist John McCarthy. He organized the Dartmouth Conference, which is considered the birthplace of AI. However, the idea of creating machines that can mimic human intelligence has been around for much longer. And I will spare you that we don't need to go that far back into history. But I thought it was interesting that it actually really began around the 1950s and 60s uh, because I thought it was developed much later, like the 80s or 90s, uh, because that's part of my lifetime. But uh, anyway, the uh, first practical applications of AI were developed in the 50s and 60s, including the first AI program, which was designed to play chess. Another thought to be the first AI program was ELIZA a chatbot that simulates talking to a therapist developed in 1966 at MIT. Since then, AI has continued to evolve and advance rapidly with breakthroughs in machine learning, deep learning, and other AI technologies leading to significant progress in recent years. Machine learning has widely been used in recent years to develop predictive models, recommendation systems, and autonomous systems, among others. Examples include Google's search algorithm, which uses machine learning to improve search results, and Netflix's recommendation system, which uses machine learning to suggest movies and TV shows based on users' viewing history. Um, You know, We all know that Instagram uses algorithms, which is also a learning program. And I mean, if you think of it, it's surprising how much AI is incorporated in our daily lives that we don't even realize. Natural language processing, NLP, has made significant strides in the past decade with advancements in speech recognition, language translation, and text analysis. Examples include Apple's Siri, Amazon's Alexa, and Google Assistant, 
which use NLP to understand and respond to voice commands. Computer vision has been used extensively in fields such as image and video recognition, self-driving cars, and facial recognition. Examples include Tesla's autopilot system, which uses computer vision to recognize and avoid obstacles on the road, and Facebook's face recognition feature, which uses computer vision to identify people in photos and videos. Robotics. Robotics has also made a significant stride in recent years with advancements in autonomy, mobility, and dexterity. Examples include Boston Dynamics robots, which can walk, run, and jump with remarkable agility, and iRobot's Roomba vacuum cleaner, which uses sensors and machine learning to navigate and clean homes autonomously. And this last example of AI is what I will be focusing on for this segment, generative AI. Generative AI has become increasingly popular in recent years, allowing machines to create realistic images, videos, and text. Examples include OpenAI's GPT-3, which can generate human-like text, and NVIDIA's Style GAN, which can create photorealistic images of faces, animals, and objects. What is GAI? Generative Artificial Intelligence, aka GAI, is an umbrella term for any kind of automated process that uses algorithms to produce, manipulate, or synthesize data, often in the form of images or human-readable text. It's called generative because the AI creates something that didn't previously exist. This information is from InfoWorld. Um, it's like an online, uh, I guess, technology website, and it is from an article from InfoWorld. There are two DAI programs that I will present to you today. These are newer releases and for right now are free to use. These programs are, I don't know, I guess it's sort of a beta testing uh, where we are, the people who are using this, are training the AI with our human text input uh, to improve the GAI performance. These two programs are J Chat GPT and Dall E D A L L dash E. I hear about Chat GPT everywhere, almost every day, and I suppose you have too. But what do you really know and understand about it, and how can you utilize it with your everyday making lifestyle with sewing, quilting, knitting, gardening, cooking, etc. I did a lot of my own research on these topics with ChatGPT. And by the way, do you wonder what the GPT stands for? Maybe not, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> G is generative, P is pre-training, and T is transformer, which basically means that the program scours the internet with information that will be a most probable response to human input. Algorithms. There is no self-thinking bot yet. If I think about it too much, it's really kind of scary. Plus, I watch way too many AI shows where AI takes over humans and the world, like Westworld, where the human AIs take revenge on the humans that made them. And in Westworld, the AIs are look just like human people. So you can't even tell <laughs> the difference in them. And uh, more recently, uh, there is, there, there's a movie on Peacock called Megan. And this one's pretty creepy too. Uh, an AI doll that is a companion to a lonely girl who just lost her parents. And she lives with her aunt, an AI scientist developer of Megan. 
this doll becomes an out of control <laughs> murdering monster. And uh, the person who made it is like um, the per- one of the people that this uh, Megan doll wants to eliminate. And it's um, it, it was a you know pretty scary movie, and yet at the same time it almost seemed so realistic of something that really uh, can happen in today's time. So if you if I think about it too much, it really kind of unnerves me. This uh, AI. Um, self-thinking AI that transforms into its own autonomous uh, being and can eliminate humans. So, yeah, isn't that nice? All right. Let me share with you the different text scenarios that I tested with ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is a you know, driven on text commands, and then it outputs uh, in text. So um, anything that you need written, ChatGPT can help you with. And I quickly understood that this GAI is best for informative text, like writing articles and essays. It did not do very well on writing a podcast script, um, because I asked it to write a podcast script about uh, sewing. And um, the first one was super short. It was like a three minute script. And it also assumed that it was a two person podcast and wrote a script for each person's part. Then I asked it to write a solo podcast for the same topic. And it was the same thing. It was the same text just for one person to read. And it was more like a commercial than a podcast. And it read really like cheesy, you know, where the the one host was saying, and consider your budget for a sewing machine. And then the other person's like, uh, well, yes, absolutely. And you mustn't also forget, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> it was, it was definitely like a, um, like a commercial. Uh, Then after I kind of got through those queries, I pretty much gathered that the best way to get the best info from ChatGPT is writing an article. That was the best output I received, and it was pretty amazing. I was really eerily surprised at how the writing style was very close to my own style um, with bullet points and very coherent, um, human written, uh, articles. So, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like that old concept from the nineties, Geigo, it applies to jet chat GPT, garbage in garbage out. The more detailed my request was, the better my response was. This program can write just about anything you want, from essays to articles to patterns, recipes, and even songs. I did ask it to write a song, which I'll get to in a little bit. All right, so I'm going to read to you some of the um, things that I asked ChatGPT to write for me. After the podcast ones, then I asked chat GPT to write an article about the history of the Lone Star quilt block. So this is a little bit of what it said. It did produce, um, you know, a pretty lengthy response, which is good because that would be an article length. But it says the Lone Star quilt block is a classic design in the world of quilting that has been beloved for generations, also known as the Texas Star of Bethlehem or I'm sorry, the Texas Star or Star of Bethlehem. This iconic design is characterized by a large central star surrounded by smaller stars or intricate geometric patterns. The history of the Lone Star quilt block is a fascinating one, rooted in American history and the art of quilting. Now that was a really good introduction paragraph, don't you think? I thought it was really, really well done. And then it just continues to talk about the Lone Star 
um, quilt block origins, which was in the early 19th century. And uh, it talked about how quilts were made from scraps of fabric and served uh, as warm covering for beds. And um, it does also point out that the exact origins of the Lone Star quilt block are unclear, but it is widely believed to have been inspired by the Star of Bethlehem. And it also may have been influenced by Native American quilting traditions, as well as the popular six-pointed star design that was commonly used in quilts during the mid-19th century. And the article continues. It talks about uh, the Lone Star block through the 20th century, the Great Depression, and, um, and then up to today, the Lone Star quilt block remains a beloved design in the world of quilting, while the traditional design features a large central star surrounded by smaller stars, modern quilters have experimented with variations on the design, incorporating new colors, fabrics, and patterns. The Lone Star design has also been adapted for use in other crafts, such as embroidery, cross-stitch, and even jewelry making. So I thought that was really good, and it just had one more paragraph about in conclusion, um, which I'll just read you the last sentence. Whether you are a seasoned quilter or a newcomer to the world of sewing and crafting, the Lone Star design is a timeless classic that is sure to inspire and delight. Yeah, I was really happy with this output from ChatGPT when I told it to write an article about the history of the Lone Star quilt block. Then I asked it to write... Oh, this is <laughs> this is the podcast script. So um, I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing, but um, let me read you a couple of the funny parts. Okay, so... The co-host says, um, well, the first thing you need to consider is the purpose of the machine. Do you need it for basic repairs and alterations, or do you plan on taking on more complex projects? Then the host says, that's a great point. If you're just starting out, you might not need a high-end machine with all the bells and whistles. A basic machine with a few stitch options will do the job. And then back to the co-host. Another thing to consider is your budget. Sewing machines come in all price ranges, from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. Well, and that's not really correct because it goes from a few hundred dollars to um, tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> um, and then the host replies, yes, and it's important to keep in mind the most expensive machine doesn't necessarily mean it's the best one for you. Now, that's a true statement. So there are some good things in this podcast script. And then the co-host says, that's right. For example, if you're planning on quilting, you'll want a machine with a larger throat space and more stitch options. That is true. But I just think it's funny where they their exchange is, that's right. And yes, so true. <laughs> uh, they end the podcast with... And don't forget to read reviews and do your research before making a purchase. Look for reviews from people who have used the machine for a while, not just first impressions. Then the host says, that's an excellent point. It's important to get a well-rounded view of the machine you're considering before you buy it. Uh, and then they just sum up everything they just said. And at the very end... Uh, the host says, that's it for today's episode of the DIY podcast. We hope you found this information helpful. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Uh, so I guess it's not as bad as I made it sound earlier, but uh, to me, it's just, um, it's, it's not a really complete podcast script, of course, because a machine is, is pulling this uh, from you know, algorithms and stuff, but it's, it's not terrible, actually. The next thing I asked it to do is to write a, pa a sewing pattern for pajama pants with an elastic waistband in cotton fabric. 
So I gave it as much detail as I could in order to get what it was that I was looking for the pattern to be, which is woven fabric, not knit fabric, uh, and an elastic waistband. So it came back with, here is a pattern for sewing pajama pants with an elastic waistband and cotton fabric. And then it starts with materials and it tells you two yards of cotton fabric, one inch wide elastic, matching thread, scissors, measuring tape, sewing machine, iron and ironing board. The two yards, two yards of cotton fabric is, um, I think, a little short. So I, I think that, well, for an adult, you need at least three yards if you're, I guess, tall. Um, but uh, two yards is not really, I don't think it's enough, especially after you wash, launder the fabric before you start cutting it out, which you should do for clothing patterns. Then it goes into the instructions, and it does tell you to pre-wash and dry uh, the cotton fabric to prevent shrinkage later. Then it says to cut out the fabric for the pajama pants. Fold the fabric in half so the selvages meet. Now, this is weird. It says then fold it in half again. The fabric should now be folded into quarters. Cut out two pieces of fabric for the front and back of the pants using the measurements below. This is where it lost me. I don't know how, I have never folded fabric into quarters to cut out uh, pajama pants. And the pattern is basically your waist measurement plus two inches. And the length is uh, length of pants plus two inches. And that's it. So of course, there are limitations to this program. And really, how would I expect it to... Um, know what pattern pieces because this is only text driven there's no graphics in with this at all so it seems to do really good with the information that was given uh, to it so it just goes through some just general sewing instructions about hemming and installing the uh, elastic waistband and then at the very end, it says, your pajama pants with elastic waistband and cotton fabric are now ready to wear. <laughs> you know, this is, um, it's not bad if you're kind of researching to try to learn how to write a sewing pattern. Uh, so it does give a structure of how to start with your the materials needed and the instructions uh, and, and then um, just... Uh, very simple like that. The next one I gave it, I was really kind of trying to trip it up <laughs> because uh, I asked ChatGPT to, I said, what is the best sewing machine? This was the answer. There is no one best sewing machine as it depends on your specific needs and preferences. However, there are some key factors to consider when choosing a sewing machine. Type of sewing, skill level, features, and price. And then it gives some popular brands of sewing machines include Brother, Singer, Janome, and Bernina. Consider doing research, reading reviews, and trying out machines before making a purchase to find the best one for you. So I didn't trip it up. And it, it responded very well, saying that there is no one best sewing machine. So it did a very good job with that. Then I switched over to knitting. Well, before I asked it to do a knit pattern, I asked, what is brioche knitting? And then it responded, brioche knitting is a type of knitting that creates a dense, squishy, and reversible fabric. It is a technique that uses yarn overs, slipped stitches, and working stitches together to create a unique texture that resembles a ribbed or honeycomb pattern. Uh, it then goes on to say how it requires um, knitting knowledge and uh, knowing the basic knitting stitches. And uh, at the end, it says one of the key features of brioche knitting is the use of a special brioche stitch, which involves knitting or purling together a stitch from the current row with a stitch from the previous row. This creates a double thick fabric that is especially warm and insulating. However, the brioche stitch 
can be challenging to master, and it may take some practice to get the tension and stitch counts just right. Again, I thought this was an excellent response to my question. So then I th- decided to have fun, and I asked it to write a song about pin cushions. <laughs> and sure enough, it came up with a whole song, four verses and a chorus. I'm not going to sing it. I don't even know what tune I would put to it, but uh, verse one is, I've got a pin cushion by my side. Sticking needles in it makes me feel alive. Sewing is my passion, my creative drive, and my pin cushion helps me thrive. And here's the chorus. Pin cushion, oh pin cushion, my little friend, my sewing cushion, stuffed with fluff and feeling so fine, helping me create one stitch at a time. That's really good. I I just was amazed at this. It's such a cute little song. Here's the second verse. I've got pins of every color and size. My pin cushion holds them all so wise. From straight pins to safety pins and more. My pin cushion has become my decor. So true because I just got a really beautiful decorative Japanese handmade pin cushion. <laughs> And it goes into the chorus again. Pin cushion, oh pin cushion, my little friend. My sewing cushion stuffed with fluff and feeling so fine. Helping me create one stitch at a time. And there's a couple more verses. I don't know that if you want me to really like go on from here. So I will um, spare you of that. Uh, And then I asked it. The next one I asked was, what are ideas on sewing a gift for a teenager? And it responded with a numbered list. It said, there are many ideas for sewing gifts for teenagers. Here are a few. Number one, pajama pants. Teenagers love comfortable clothes and pajama pants are always a hit. Choose a fun, colorful fabric and add some personalized touches like pockets or fun trims. The second one is a tote bag. The third one are scrunchies. Fourth one is a hoodie. Fifth one is a makeup bag. And the sixth one is earbud case. Teenagers are always listening to music or podcasts. So a handmade earbud case can be a practical gift. Choose a fabric that matches their style and add a fun zipper pull or applique. These are just a few ideas to get you started. The key is to choose a gift that matches their interests and personality and to add some personalized touches to make it extra special. Again, this was brilliant. It's so like you can use this chat GPT for ideas like this. Like if you're stuck and you want to make your niece or nephew or kid that's a teenager who, you know, it's so hard to, you know, figure out what they really like or want. This is a great list. And this is a great resource to find that out. Uh, Then I asked it to write a pattern for a 12 inch square log cabin quilt block. So I added the size I needed, the type of block, and um, that it is a pattern. So it responded, here's a pattern, and it repeats exactly what I said, a 12-inch square log and <laughs> a 12-inch square log cabin quilt block. Finished quilt block size, 12 inches by 12 inches. Materials needed. Fabric strips in assorted colors, at least six different colors. Background fabric, one yard. That's a lot of yardage for the background of one block. <laughs> Rotary cutter, ruler, and mat, sewing machine and thread. Now it goes into the instructions and it says to cut a two and a half by two and a half inch square from your center fabric. This will be the center of your block. Step number two, cut a strip of fabric two and a half inches wide and sew it to one side of the center square. Press the seam towards the added strip. And then it goes on step by step of telling you to add another two and a half inch strip. It does not say how long to cut each two and a half inch strip. So that would be something you'd have to figure out yourself. 
Uh, and then it says to keep adding the strips in the same manner. The one thing I thought was interesting was when you got to a the six and a half inch square size, it then says to trim the edges of the block to make it square. This will be your starting point for the next round of strips. So I thought, I've never made a log cabin block that way before. And it actually is a really good idea. It's sort of like a check of you know, your sewing accuracy. And before you, you know, get totally off base with it maybe being too, you know, you took too big of a seam or whatever, um, it's a good checkpoint. So uh, I thought that was interesting. And then it says to continue like before with adding the two and a half inch uh, strips around the block until it, um, well, then it tells you at nine and a half inches to trim it again. And then you repeat it until it measures 12 and a half inches square. Uh, So there were really detailed instructions. And then it has a note at the end. You can use more or fewer rounds of strips to achieve the desired size of your block. Just be sure to start with a square that is half the size of your finished block. In this case, a six and a half by six and a half square for a 12 inch finished block. So that didn't really make sense to me, really, because the square in the very center of the block is a two and a half inch square. Uh, So, you know, there's like little, you know, blips here and there. But overall, I thought it did great on writing a pattern for a log cabin block. I also asked it to write a a, a knit dish cloth pattern. And... I kept this one very vague because I just wanted to see what it would do. And it did really well. (laughs) It says, here is a simple pattern for a hand-knit dishcloth. The materials, worsted weight cotton yarn, U.S. size 7 or 4.5 millimeter knitting needles. Instructions. Cast on 38 stitches. Row 1. Knit all the stitches. Row two, knit three, purl 32, knit three. Repeat rows one and two until the dish cloth is square, about eight inches. Then bind off all the stitches. And then it adds an option, add a crochet border around the edges for a finished look. It doesn't tell you how to do that, but it says it's an option that you could do. At the very end, it says, note, This pattern is just a guideline, so feel free to adjust the number of stitches and rows to make the dishcloth bigger or smaller. Also, cotton yarn is recommended for dishcloths because it is absorbent and easy to clean. This pattern as is could be made and be great. So that was, I mean, pretty good. It's a very simple uh, pattern to write, but I thought that, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing that a computer generated this pattern based on my gener- generic general um, question of pattern for a hand knit dishcloth. <laughs> um, then I got a bit more specific. And then I, um, <laughs> I, I asked it how to hand knit an Easter egg pattern. Um, it did okay, but it definitely did not you if you followed these direction, you would not end up with an Easter egg because it knit it in the flat. It didn't knit it in the round. And all of a sudden, at the very end, it says to pull your yarn tail, make a long yarn tail, thread it through the remaining stitches, which are the last stitches at the top. So pull tight and secure the end. It didn't say to do that at the beginning. And so basically you would have like a a cinched top of a flat piece of uh, knit fabric. So this one was a kind of a fail. Uh, But, you know, this is a this is just a computer program. All right. I just have a couple more because I don't want to continue to bore you. But um, I did also ask it a specific thing of how to clean a Bernina 780 sewing machine, which is the sewing machine I have. And it, it did 
actually have a couple of things that is specific to the Bernina sewing machines, which is um, to remove the stitch plate by pressing the button on the right side. Um, oh, you know what? That's wrong. You open the stitch plate by pressing on the right side of the stitch plate, not the right side of the machine, like it says. Uh, and then it just says the gen general things, like using a brush to remove the lint from the stitch plate in the feed dog area. Uh, and everything else was just really not um, anything specific to the Bernina 780, like with the bobbin um, area and um, to oil it when you clean it. So this was kind of missing some stuff. Um, and then it definitely was incorrect about saying that the stitch plate um, had a release button on the right side of the machine. Uh, then I asked it about how to clean a Juki 2010Q sewing machine. And it pretty much said the same thing. Unplug it from the power source, remove the presser foot and needle, and using the small brush. So it was just very general and vague. Um and basically like reinserting the needle in the presser foot. So again, nothing about oiling this machine. Then the last thing I asked it was how to maintain a mechanical sewing machine. This is where the only time where it said to oil it regularly. Uh, so, um, and then on this one, it changed it up a little bit and said to, to, clean it after every project or at least once a week uh, from the feed dogs, the bobbin case, the shuttle race, um, use a soft brush, lint roller, or vacuum attachment to clean the machine's interior and exterior, oil it regularly, use high quality thread. Uh, it says low quality thread can cause lint and debris buildup, leading to poor stitch quality and potential damage to your machine. Replace the needles regularly and store it properly. So these were tips that were different than the first two, how to clean um, the Bernina and the Juki sewing machine. So when it went to the mechanical, it sort of went in a different direction there. Uh, yeah, and then, the, oh, actually, I did ask it um, how to maintain a computerized sewing machine. And that one was similar to the... Um, the Juki one, where it said to oil it regularly. Now this says, while computerized sewing machines require less oiling than mechanical ones, it's still essential to lubricate the moving parts occasionally. Consult your machine's manual for specific instructions on oiling. So that was interesting. And then it said to keep it updated. Check for firmware updates for your machine and install them as needed. Uh, so it addressed the software on the uh, computerized sewing machines in the maintenance. And um, everything else was exactly the same as the maintenance for the other sewing machines. Then I moved on to cooking and I asked it to write a recipe for tonkatsu ramen. I love tokatsu ramen soup and um, it starts with what it is tonkatsu ramen is a delicious japanese noodle soup that features rich creamy pork broth and a variety of toppings such as sliced pork boiled egg and green onions here's a recipe to make it at home it goes through the ingredients uh, and it's very accurate i think it has all of the um, ingredients that you need to make the bone broth, um, saying that you need two pounds of pork bones, um, the, the soy sauce, sake, mirin, ramen noodles, and um, then it goes into the instructions. And I believe that I could make this recipe and come out with a very successful tonkatsu ramen soup. I was really happy with that one. 
Uh, then I asked it for a recipe. I kept this one vague on purpose because I wanted to see what type of cupcakes it would um, write a recipe for. So it wrote a recipe for vanilla birthday cakes with buttercream frosting. This one looked pretty doable as well. Very well written. Preheat your oven to 350 Fahrenheit. Uh, and, and that one was good. Then I got more specific and I said, write a recipe for Ina Garten's coconut cake. That's actually one of my favorite cakes of all time is Ina Garten's coconut cake. And it found her recipe and totally like put it in here. So, um, her recipe, this recipe is actually out there. So available to the public. So I think that's probably why it was able to find it. And it went through every ingredient, which I know this recipe almost by heart. And like, for instance, it takes five eggs, <laughs> uh, coconut milk, um, cream cheese is the frosting. And uh, yeah, it, it did a really good job with that. Then I asked it to write a recipe for gluten-free chocolate chip cookies with Ghirardelli chocolate chips. It did a pretty good job with this, only it refers to using two cups of gluten-free all-purpose flour. And I don't know too much about gluten-free flour, so hopefully all-purpose gluten-free flour exists. Otherwise, I would think that you might use almond flour or something like that when you're making gluten-free cookies, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, so it was fun. It's really fun to um, go through and just ask ChatGPT to write up all of these things. <laughs> it was really fun. Uh, so uh, I think I will kind of continue playing with it while this software is free. You just go to, you know, do a Google search on ChatGPT and you can try it out. It's, there's a little button on the page that says try it out. The second type of AI, GAI, that I want to present to you is DALL-E, -E, D-A-L-L-E. This is a program that generates vibrant and realistic images based on text prompts. We often refer to these systems and others like them as models because they represent an attempt to simulate or model some aspect of the real world based on a subset of information about it. So I went to the Doll E website and um, right away, the difference of this is that you are giving it text instructions to produce an image. And the other thing is they only allow you about 10 or 15 tries at this, and then you have to buy more what they call credits. It will um, refresh the credits to 10 credits a month after um, the first month. So um, I used up almost all of my credits in one shot, but that was because I was researching for this episode. And um, my first text request was to make a watercolor of a terrier shepherd mix dog knitting. <laughs> I, one thing I noticed about some of the examples of this is that people ask this program to make the most like strange images of like one of the examples was um an angry cat in a spaceship <laughs> and it looks so funny. So, uh, but um, I was trying to get it to come up with an image close to what my dog Cooper looks like. And he is a terrier shepherd mix. It makes four images. And one of these images was kind of close, which was pretty surprising to me. Uh, but I wanted to see if I could get a closer image that represented Cooper. So I got more detailed in my next request. A watercolor of a Staffordshire Shepherd mixed dog knitting. Because Cooper um, sort of uh, has that Staffordshire sort of build 
uh, with a shepherd face and the tail and the hind legs of a German shepherd. But actually, my first request came out better. And there was a dog that looked pretty close to the image of Cooper, just not ex the exact coloring. Uh, I will uh, show these pictures on my podcast blog so you can see them. Uh, but it was it was really fun because uh, the image that was closest to Cooper was a dog wearing a knit sweater, and he he looks like he was unraveling a knit blanket with a piece with the yarn in his mouth, kind of pulling it from the blanket. Then I wanted an impressionist painting of a woman with black hair like me, hand sewing with her. Um, terrier shepherd dog in a field of poppies it gave me um also uh the woman with the black hair but it also gave me dogs with black fur <laughs> so i redid the query with a brown dog description i got a better looking dog but the compositions were so much worse it, they were they were awful if that was like my first response, I would have really been disappointed. But the first response with the first four um, Impressionist paintings looked really good. I also said uh, wearing a purple linen dress as well. So I kind of like tried to get really detailed. Uh, and then there is a feature where you can upload a photo and tell it what type of image that you want. It could do pixelated, oil painting, watercolor, um, just, I mean, I'm sure I could tell it to like, you know, paint it in a Lego style <laughs> image. But uh, I uploaded a photo of me and Cooper, and this was a major fail. It manipulated us um, in, in the shapes of our faces, switched our positions in the photo, Two of the pictures gave me a really super fat face and a smaller face on Cooper. It was almost like if you were in the the mirrors room, um, you know, at the fair. It had his ears folded back. It was awful. I really did not like it one bit. Uh, so then I asked it to make a logo for Make and Decorate. That was also terrible. I told it three colors and to make um, the logo, and it was just awful. I probably could have maybe given it more detail, but if I've got to give it exactly the font it has to use and the designs, then why am I going to ask it to make me this logo? I could just go do it then if I know exactly what I want. Um, and then finally, I asked for an oil painting, um, again, of me. <laughs> A woman with black hair wearing Liberty Tana Lawn in the Wiltshire pattern and a sewing machine with a purple background. And it did a fairly decent job of this. All the sewing machines were those antique Singer black sewing machines with the uh, tables that they came with. One of the... Um, the images had a window with a pretty landscape outside. So I thought that was really nice. And then I did uh, the same query, but I told it with a uh, landscape background with cherry blossom trees. And that also came out really pretty. Um, the Wiltshire pattern, it didn't really get but uh, it tried to do some sort of a print on the dress. It was very vague and definitely not Liberty. So um, I guess it's it only has its certain capabilities. But um, yeah, this, this program is okay. I was actually much more impressed and enamored with chat GPT. This doll E is okay, and it's really just, um, I think, something to have fun with if you want to make these really outlandish images in the form of paintings. Like there was an oil painting of a cat with a crown and the velvet, um, you know, robe that a king would wear in the 1700s. So, um, 
that that part of it is fun to do. In conclusion, AI is already incorporated into our daily living, whether we realize it or want it. It is there. It's in Google, Alexa, Siri, um, you know, Instagram, Amazon, all of it. And the unknown is very scary to a lot of us. The Wall Street Journal did a story on AI in the fashion sewing industry, and this was done five years ago. At that time, sewing robotic machines were replacing humans at an alarming pace in Bangladesh, which is dependent upon their textile manufacturing industry. And in 2017, a Chinese apparel company opened a factory in Little Rock, Arkansas, and it used a U.S. company's software. The company's name is called Software Automation, and it made sew bots to sew T-shirts. The sew bot can make a T-shirt in 26 seconds at 33 cents a shirt. They make clothing for Adidas and Armani as well. So this is like the epitome of fast fashion. And many name brand companies have embraced the Sobot technology, H&M, Amazon, Nike, and Walmart are also going the Sobot route. It's, it's pretty disheartening to hear. And especially for us creatives and um, we are very passionate about making and things that are handmade and the craftsmanship and the art of it. And it also stokes a fire for me to continue to sew my own clothing. Not that I can sew every piece of clothing I wear. I cannot, but I can make a few items of clothing every year and, um, you know, slowly build up a wardrobe. I've already been downsizing my wardrobe and um, just, it, it, you know, it's just, um, it's gotten just like too much, too much stuff. <laughs> and um, I, I just, um, I want to continue to sew clothing, interior decor hand knit clothing and accessories and anything I can find the time to make. There really is little we can do about the advancement of global technology that may or may not be good for the world. However, we can continue to make, 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 and we can buy from makers, support small handmade businesses and each other. I know that this movement has already made an impact globally, and I mean the movement of the resurgence of sewing, clothing, quilting, and just making and crafts and arts, period. So that's a good thing. I, you know, you can just look at the emerging independent pattern makers out there. There's so many more. Their size inclusivity and higher quality fabrics being made available to the home sewing market. And here is a hot off the press example. Badgley and Mishka fabrics are being sold at Joann's. I just got an email from Joann's and they were um, launching this Badgley and Mishka thing. And they um, are under their name, Badgley and Mishka. They are bridal and special occasion fabrics from about $20 a yard for plain stretch satin to about $70 a yard for beaded and sequined fabrics. So they seem to be very nice quality fabrics. And the more expensive fabrics have very nice detail added to them, like beads and sequins for special occasions. They have a line of decorative trims and they also have special occasion jewelry to go with all of these fabrics. And the fabric colors are really nice, sort of um, light 
um, colors, sort of the... I don't know that because it's bridal. Of course, there are whites and off whites, and um, I saw this really pretty, like almost like an ice blue, um, and it looks really nice. So, just by reading about that and seeing what's um, going to be available, uh, you know they they also partnered with Vogue Patterns, so they will. I mean, it's basically like a one stop shop for an entire special occasion look. You've got the pattern, you have the fabrics, the trims, and even the jewelry. The only things they don't have there are shoes (laughs) at Joann's. But um, I just thought that this is a good indicator that these types of designers are paying attention to markets uh, that are growing and that they haven't been before. Uh, so I think it's a good thing. And um, also home decor. We've got the talent and the skills to make our homes amazingly beautiful in our own way, our style, our colors, pillows and quilts, wall hangings, window treatments, even rope rugs that were so popular a few years ago. All of this, we have the skills to make our homes beautiful and handmade. So stop looking at Pinterest with the intent of having to keep up with the Joneses or the trends and use Pinterest to find inspiration for what best tells your story and style. And don't apologize for it. It's you. It's your home. You live there and it has to be your sanctuary. My final thoughts on ChatGPT and DALL-E, I love ChatGPT. It's fun, entertaining, and it can be a great tool for research and a shortcut to information other than using Google, which can often take you on down a rabbit hole tangent. The DALL-E is also fun, but I find it less useful for anything other than amusement. Also, it has limited use, and then the charges for the extra queries. Um, so, it, and also, I feel like the understanding or the training that it has had is not as good as ChatGPT. So, um, but I think that also, you know, uh, Typing in text to produce text is much simpler than typing in text and expecting a um, a visual image is also very different and probably more difficult uh, to produce. My husband actually used G- ChatGPT to look up logistic trucking terms and definitions for his work, and uh, he determined which output was actually accurate or not. He was also very surprised at how good ChatGPT is. So give it a whirl while it's free, because after a while, I hear that it will become a paid subscription to use. I hope you enjoyed this topic of GAI today, and I'm very curious to hear from you about your experience with ChatGPT or DALL-E. Let me know on DMs, email, or also don't forget to use the voicemail tab on my podcast page at makeanddecorate.com. In fact, Use the voicemail to ask me anything. There's only a couple more episodes left in the season, and I would like to answer your questions or comments on these upcoming episodes. So ask me anything, and I will put it on the show. So don't forget, it is a little purple tab, and it says voicemail. So click on that, and you can re-record it if you mess up or whatever, but give it a give it a try. Uh, On the next episode, I chat with Minky Kim. Minky Kim has the uh, really great YouTube channel and she makes patterns for all of these really cute, small accessory items like zipper pouches and coasters and so forth. So you will not want to miss that episode. Until next time, take some time to make, make, make. 
Bye-bye.